and with me here is Howard Goldcrant, our innovation director over at Conde Nast ID Active and also the executive producer of our new uh, project that we're going to discuss. Also with us is Sean Stewart, the founder and head writer of Fourth Wall Studios. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Condé Nast ID Active, because we're relatively new, like many of the companies over here, we're a new agency that's built on the Condé Nast DNA. And Condé Nast is the publisher of brands like Vanity Fair, Vogue, Wired, GQ, The New Yorker, and many others. And as an agency, what we are looking to do right now is really take our storytelling expertise and apply it to brands. And in the universe where there's constant launch of new platforms and connected devices, our storytelling is rap rapidly evolving. So our project today is really um, an R&D, uh, a piece of R&D or a prototyping of how we're thinking about story. And so Howard and Sean are going to talk a little bit more about that. And I think Howard and Sean are also very representative of the type of collaborations that we foster over at Condé Nast, ID Active. We really like to collaborate with like great talent, new companies that are innovating in this space. And uh, so far, it's been a fantastic collaboration. Howard's background is he's been deep in immersive media for many years. He is um, behind Sound Lab, which is a creative community built around uh, software expression and electronic music. He's also been involved with innovating brands like Tom's, Dexter, uh, Napster, and many others. And Sean is um, a prolific writer. So he, before launching Fourth Wall Studios, he was involved with, Min actually I have to look at this because you've done so much over here. You have, um, he was the lead writer behind The Beast for Steven Spielberg's Artificial Intelligence AI. He was also behind Halo 2, I Love Beast campaign, Nine Inch Nails, Year Zero, and Eagle Eye Freefall. In addition to that, he's written many uh, successful uh, sci-fi novels. And also the only Yoda-focused Star Wars book. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to dive straight into it. And in fact, it's like we have two really interesting and opinionated uh, gentlemen up here on the stage, so it should make for a lively discussion. Why don't we start with you, Howard, and why don't you talk a little bit about our project and our thinking behind um, the Condé Nast Transmedia or Immersive Media project that we're uh, developing right now. Great. So thank you for having us, and thank you for letting us be on this stage with you. Um, we are in a really interesting process with this project, which is for ID Active, how do we actually prototype? How do we actually start working with, pushing against, trying new media tools for new media storytelling with our brands? So instead of trying to, in an old agency model, sell something through to a client that we're really not sure of yet, rather we want to experiment with ourselves on our own investment with new media tools to tell stories, right? And how that can be so that with all the bespoke solutions that we want to create for our brands, we can do that having experienced it ourselves and bring them through that. Um, I've worked in the ARG world. Sean's worked in the ARG world making that. But now we're all looking at new tools, authoring tools. The project we're working on is a really beautiful script um, that's been collaborated with um, a director from RSA, which is Ridley Scott's film group, is a young director named Phil Van. And together we've written a, just a two-minute piece that we're exploring um, around this idea of cultural foresight. One of the aspects of ID Active is the cultural foresight that Condé Nast has been practicing for over 100 years. Right? A lot of people look at magazine and publishing as old media and old world. And what we're starting to understand is actually everybody wants to be content makers. Well, Condé Nast has been doing that for over 100 years. And not only doing that, but having to reach out into culture forward. Right? Thinking forward. When you're in the old world publishing model, you had to think forward to make sure you were on time in culture when you were producing. So using that, we started to think about what is that really essence about from Condé Nast. So we wrote a story that's about a contagion, a little virus that you catch that gives you forward flash. So this woman's in an office, and all of a sudden she's having these experiences of forward flashing and starting to search the web for what is going on to me. And, you know, this discussion happens and some interaction happens in the office. So a very exciting way to start thinking about uh, how we can build story. And then in doing that, we started to think about 
different kind of storytellers and makers that are using tools for us to engage with those immersive aspects. And that's kind of where I'll let this shift to Sean and why this collaboration and why we encourage that kind of work coming from ID Active um, can happen. So is that, is that Yeah, cool? absolutely. It's Thanks. Like, why don't you share a little bit in terms of how we're partnering in this project? So uh, on this project, um, we're developing a, a platform for creating story ideas that reach um, not only across video, but simultaneously um, through email and text and phone calls so that you're, you can get out and touch your audience in many, many different ways. Um, in terms of what our last speaker was talking about, um, since the guy is sitting there watching your show with their cell phone, make the cell phone part of the show. Um, you mitigate the bounce and distraction outwards. Also, it's the way we live now. We live with our tablets and our smartphones. And the storytelling of the next few decades has to evolve to meet that change in our behavior. Um, one of the things that Howard said earlier um, when we were talking that I thought was really interesting was the idea of the pop-up book and how delightful it is when you're a kid and you turn the page and something grows out of it. Um, that has two lovely elements. One, it adds a dimension that you didn't expect. It makes it richer and more concrete. And secondly, all you did was turn the page, and yet you made something happen. And that idea of agency is something that's really important when you're delivering content that is often being uh, consumed across a computer or a smartphone or something else that has that button marked sent. In this world, we're used to the machine knowing that we're there and responding to us. So we're trying to make with the Rides platform stories that dimensionalize the experience and stories that know you're there and pay attention to you. So, Sean, tell me a little bit more about Rides. Are, are, is the audience here familiar with Rides? Have you heard of that expression? Uh -huh. It's something that's kind of... Uh, becoming more common in the vernacular right now. Do you want to so, talk a little yeah, bit more about sure. that? Yeah, sure. The idea of a ride is just what we said. It's a finite experience. Like Howard and I both have experience in ARGs, which is basically you try to confuse people as much as you humanly can for as long as you humanly can until they die of exhaustion, but <laughs> it was really cool. Um, having done that for a while, we thought we'd try making something that is in fact easy to consume, like a ride at an amusement park. It starts, you have a hell of a fun time, and then 10 minutes later, it's over, or 20, or 5, or 2. Um, so uh, I might just give you, a s because that's pretty abstract, I might give you a couple of small examples. I'm going to show you a trailer for a show that's actually debuting on the 23rd of April. Um, we're going into live private beta uh, now, back in Los Angeles. So everyone is desperately looking for bugs and trying to fix them. And this is a fourth wall project, It's right? a fourth wall project that's sort of the setup for the project that we're going to build with Condé Nast in terms of building this platform and infrastructure. So it's a show that could be a TV show. It's about a crime scene cleanup crew. And I hope when you see the trailer, you'll think, that's a funny show, I'd watch that. But I also want you to pay attention to little things that are not just the movie, as it were, but the movie camera, the way it's begin going to uh, reach a little further than normal television does. Sound would be excellent at this point. But perhaps sound is not forthcoming? All right. Do you want to roll back? Right. Can we roll back and do that with sound from the beginning? I'll try not to take a long time. And I'll speak very quickly in short words <laughs> with few vowels afterwards. You. I'm Pete. What are you guys doing here? We clean up crime scenes. And, uh, well, obviously, something happened here. You are sending me to clean up stuff that most people, I'm happy when it's brains. Pack the van for a murder. Get the job done or you're fired. I'm not the boss, kitten. Well, I'm in charge. You know the location. Yeah, I know the location because I'm in charge. He's a child. We carry his baby ass. Why not date Michelle? Because she's, I don't know. Got a dick? You are so cool. 
First rule of cleaning up a blood tableau, look up. Oh, that's bad, right? What's the plan? You put everything back. Exactly the way it was. Are you serious? You want to tamper with a homicide scene twice. Forensics are on the way. Starting to creep everybody out. Am I creeping you out? Mostly. But there's some wiggle room. My favorite kind of room. The wiggle room. I don't even care anymore. That's the spirit. Yeah. All right. So as you can tell, it's a passionate love story set in a Celtic time period. Um, all right, so that's a show, and hopefully that would be a fun show to watch. But let's talk a little bit about some of the things um, that we're trying to do to give those two things we talked about earlier, a sense of agency, a sense that the show knows you're there and watching it, and also a sense of coming through some of the devices that, for instance, the gentleman from Applecaster was talking about. Um, First, we're going to present the video content, but we're going to do it with a timeline along the bottom. And unlike some of my previous projects, you can actually hit pause um, or play or all the things you expect to be able to do to control your media because we know today's consumer doesn't want to just show up Wednesday at 8 and things happen. They like to control their experience. When we're going to do something like reach beyond the screen and call your phone, we're going to let you know that we're doing that so that the experience isn't confusing. So tell me a little bit how the phone experience might work for, um, for, uh, in terms of our storytelling. So, for instance, um, here's an example. Imagine uh, you're watching a Gossip Girl sort of show, and two guys are talking about their girlfriends, and they're talking about where they're going to break up with one of them. And then your phone rings, and you hear a conversation between one of the girls and her doctor telling you that she's pregnant. Now suddenly you've really dimensionalized the story because you know something terribly important that plays against the scene in front of you. You always balance these things so you're not running dialogue against dialogue. Um, that episode probably works even better as a text message so that you have this information that's coming back and forth and that's very personal to you. The other thing is, the first time people do this, they're not going to give us their phone numbers, so we always give them the option to just send it to screen. As time goes by, as they come to trust us, and they want a richer experience, we make it easy and pleasant for them to do that. The other thing we do, like a game system, is when you do something, we reward you. We say, you answered the phone, you're a rock star, you're continuing your progress button. One of the things people often say is, what happened to men 18 to 35 watching TV? Obviously, they got outcompeted by the Xbox. Think about it. I finish a mission in Call of Duty, I get a badge. I finish an act of a TV show, I get a car insurance commercial. Um, we'd like to reward you for actually participating and knowing that you're there. Um, here, we'd like to give you achievements for answering the phone, watching to the end of the video, uh, if we can, inhaling. Here's an example of what would be a traditional commercial break at an act break. If there is someone has answered the phone or the text or the email, um, but up there, there's a piece of content that they had a chance to explore, but didn't during the run of the show. Now they can either go back or go directly into part two. So those are just a few things um, about how you can try to build a show that actually knows you're out there and wants you to watch and uh, envelops you in that way. So Howard, tell me a little bit more in terms of how brands or other creators, how important the ride is and how they can yeah. think about it when they're creating. What I love about what Fourth Wall is doing and other companies that are starting to explore the immersive space is that we need to build new habits, right? We want to and we need to. And we need to, um, the word dimensionalized I think is really important, right? Right now we're dealing with a lot of flat media, right? And how do we actually pull that apart? It doesn't have to just be layering, right? So yeah, I can have a Twitter feed going alongside. This still feels like it's still within flat media space. It's still a very 20th century model. 21st century model is I'm holding that phone, my phone rings, and now I'm a part of that story. 
I get involved in a different way. I'm able to engage with the community to actually motivate through um, my fan experience with the story. That sort of stuff I think is really important. So I think let's right talk a little bit more about that. Like what is the viewer's role? It's like is he, is he or she a participant? Are they shaping the story? Are they driving the narrative? Or I think for each sort of bespoke solution, they're different. It really depends on what the brand is. I think right now um, when you have, you know, 300 people or 3 million people or 10 million people um, on your Facebook page, you have to really think about what's it mean to create a dinner party for that many people. And when you have a dinner party, it's not a talk. It's not that everybody's gathered around to listen to one person. It's actually about the crosstalk. It's actually about you had a good time because I met Janine there, I met Sean there, we had different conversations. Right now we're shouting even at our social media. We're shouting at them thinking they're all the same. But they're there for different reasons. So depending on what the brand solution is, you're doing a launch, you're sort of extending a show, whatever that is, we might have users that it's important to move the narrative along because they interact. Or in this case, it might be that users share, right? There's share buttons all involved. They share and all of a sudden, that fan community actually is bonding together based on a character, based on the scenario. And maybe there's even an unlock for more content that's based on each other's communication. I think that kind of participation is almost more important than participation with, hey, I like you, right? Raising your hand right. and saying, I like you as a fan is awesome. We love it. What's really cool is when two fans get together and actually bond over the fact that their sort of affinity with that brand or that experience or that story means something. And the example I'll use is one of my favorites is when we built the ARG for Dexter, one of our bloggers, you know, a, a fan, she said, Harry Potter never emailed me. And that was really important moment for her is that she loves Harry Potter. She does everything Harry Potter, right? But now she was engaged in an experience that the phone was ringing. The experience was happening. She had to engage. And it totally changed her outlook on what immersion with a story could be. It wasn't just about, oh, I love, you know, Michael C. Hall's character. I love whatever's going on in Dexter. Or I love Harry Potter. It was actually that a new story was being created with them and that the participants were understood as characters in the narrative. And that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're going to use user-generated content every time in the story. This piece that Sean's showing here is linear in a sense. It does have a beginning, middle, and end. That's fine. What we aren't taking into account is the actual dimensionality of the immersion with our fans. And that's, a, a, I think, a, a new level for brands to explore and really open themselves up to. And it's scary, um, but I think that, again, at a dinner party, you don't just put the food on the table and walk away. And I think the brand needs to really be good hosts um, and really understand how to create the right seating and the right sort of mood for what's going on. Excellent. So can, I, can I follow on just for absolutely. a very, very short anecdote? So uh, I started this in this business. Um, I fell into it with a project uh, that's now called The Beast for Steven Spielberg's movie AI. And one of the things that the main character did is send out an email every week just to say what was going on in her life. And if you wanted, you could get that. Um, but remind them what year this was. This is 2001. DSL penetration, 4%. So we were kind of working a little ahead. Um, at one point in the narrative, um, the main character's grandmother, who had raised her from a child, um, died. I woke up the next morning, I checked the inbox, and there were more than 10,000 condolence emails. Think about that for a minute. That, for me, was a transformative moment, because up to that point, I was a novelist. I had published 10 books. I had won awards. Nobody ever writes Scarlett O'Hara and says, hey, so sorry about the burning of Atlanta. Hope things work out with Rhett. Because Scarlett's just there on the screen. She doesn't live in your world. This character emailed you. She's as real to you as your cousin in Cleveland, um, in all ways. And that is an amazing, amazing change. And one of the reasons I've been spending the last 10 years working in this space, because the distance between the audience and the characters and the engagement of the audience and the characters is so vivid and so hot. So in your 10 years of being in this space, and for you, like many years as well, talk to me about a couple of key learnings as you're thinking about storytelling uh, on a rides platform in this new space. Respect your audience. Um, is one, don't talk down to them. 
And then um, I guess one thing I would say is there are a lot of ways to interact. Um, Howard made the point earlier that each story and each solution is different. Um, voting directly affects who's going forward and who's not on American Idol. That's awesome. Now I want you to perform this thought experiment. Would Macbeth be better if people got to vote on which ending to use? Eh, probably not. But are there other ways that we can make people feel part of the story and that they have agency and that the story recognizes them? Yes, there are. It's not always as simple as the audience gets to choose the ending. There are a lot more ways to skin that cat. Yeah, I, I would say that it's all about uh, failing. And it's about doing and doing and doing again. And the more often that you do, uh, that the more often that you'll be successful, actually. Um, and I think that even within the little campaign that you're running, this isn't like, oh, I tried that campaign, I'll try something else. Literally, you know, when we're telling stories, we're trying things, we're engaging, you know, all the time. And some things are more successful. And it's actually the things that you didn't realize is when those things actually amplify. And if you're not paying attention, you miss that moment to actually bring the audience deeper. So when we talk about branded entertainment or brand engagement, I think we have to think so far beyond product placement, right? I think we have to really drill down and really sort of smell the essence of that brand or that product within that brand, right? So in large companies, they may have you know, a whole spectrum of brands. It doesn't mean that you can't make a storytelling experience for a perfume. But is what I'm going to suggest is that there is a difference between brochure wear we call it, you know, where we're just trying to tell you specs or about that thing and really trying to analyze the essence of what that thing is then make something beautiful with that. And I would say that for me, the, the lesson has been fail and fail often and fail hard because that means that the successes are there. And if you don't do that or you don't, you know, actually put yourself against the opportunity to be successful, you won't find that. And the audiences are there. They're, they want, we they're not separate from us. We want that, you know? And that's, I think, uh, for me, one of the main lessons. And then the other one that I kind of learned from these guys is that we, meaning me, is stupid. The internet, very smart, right? And so when you connect people, you have a whole nother thing going on. And these guys taught me that very early in the projects no, we were not doing. Not in the form Howard is stupid. <laughs> yeah, well, that in, was... In the form that the internet is smart. <laughs> yeah. We could share some emails later about that. But, <laughs> but no, My they story did. and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> no, but that's a lovely idea is to not think about always your consumer as an individual out there, but as part of a community, as part of a group. And that community doesn't mean everybody who loves your brand is always going to love you. They're doing 20 different things, right? So you have to be honored by the fact that they're engaging with you at all. Right? And at Con and Nafs, we have such a great opportunity to work with luxury brands, you know, people who really care and invest in their product. But how that then plays out in story is going to be a really interesting and exciting future. And I think just respecting how that community can interact is something that's uh, uh, a new world for us. Now, one last question. It's like we've had many discussions in terms of story and technology. And one of the recurring themes is always story first, story first. So do you build the story and you figure out the ways to like tie in the different like devices and platforms? and? We, so... In our case, um, the Rides platform is, uh, I'll say, it's a movie camera for the movies of the next century. Um, we're not going to make everything that goes on that platform. I invite anyone in the room who wants to tell a story and have a solution already in place for reaching out at these other ways to come talk to me because let's do something awesome together. The story, you can't use a gimmick and assume it will work twice. In the long run, we don't all want to be in the business of having to think of a new gimmick every time. We want to find the ways in which this really moves people and which the technology has to serve the story rather than just be a, uh, distracting, oh, I haven't seen that before, and then move along. Um, we want to make that tech serve mm, the emotional power of the experience you're trying to create. So. Great. Anything to add to that, Howard? No, I think that if you don't do that, then you risk disrespecting your audience, which is the key point, right? So if you're just doing tricky, gadgety, you know, cool stuff, whiz-bang, great. There's no actual emotional investment in that, 
right? And that way when you use, you know, we can do with them 360 camera. We can have people search around spaces, finding different conversations. The idea that your phone can ring could be really cool or really stupid and annoying. And it's really important to find that with the story, to sit with the writers, to actually push. You may have a goal where you want to, but at the end, you know, the first time I did uh, virtual reality, like the old school heads up, which was in the 90s at a uh, film festival, thank you, for in Berlin. You know, at the end, the product sponsor had you in this space and you put out your hand to reach for something and then you couldn't see it and they put the product in your hand. It was actually the worst moment for me. I was so excited to be in this space and whatever and then they put the product in my hand and everything fell apart. And I think we have to be very careful about when we want the consumer to actually reach for our product as opposed to put it in their hand. And I think that moment is... is, is sort of interesting and dangerous um, for us. One, one of the things that I, I think is true is that now more than ever there's a partnership between um, creators and the audience. Um, you don't want to say, watch this. You want to say, I have music. We could dance. Would you care to? Uh, to that end, maybe we yeah, should absolutely. We have dance a few with more the people for here. Q&A if anybody has any questions. Can we have a... Oops. Tell us more about the technical requirements that shall be, shall be met to achieve this good engagement with the audience. And uh, just some general information about how much would it cost for a brand. <laughs> It very, oh, actually, I'll talk a little bit in terms of the cost, and I'm going to turn technology over to you. It's like, it really, truly does vary, and it's like it varies on the type of production values that you're, or the type of production that you're looking for, the type of story that you're telling. So there's a wide spectrum to that, and I'll turn uh, tech over to you. One of the nice things about um, the Rides platform is that it's built. Um, so, you know, like I say, we're in beta. Uh, it's done. Uh, and so it doesn't have to be insanely expensive to use. Um, you're still going to make the story you're going to make. If you're using video with high production value, that's still going to cost what it's going to cost. Um, in terms of the end user, if that's your question, the stuff we're building assumes, you know, people are sitting there with a regular TV and a regular laptop and a, uh, either they have a smartphone or if they don't, we just let them default to using the screen. So. The whole idea is to stop making new media something that only the cool kids can do. Um, the first project we did when we started Fourth Wall was something for Eagle Eye. And on the user board, someone wrote, this was so cool, I showed it to my mother-in-law and she loved it. And it was like, yes, the mother-in-law barrier! Because, you know, there were five years of not so much stuff that the mother-in-law would do. Uh, so we try to make this easy. We try not to ask you to have extra tech or download extra stuff or any of that. So this is, for me, a question of authoring tools, right? So right now, we have a very strong practice of filming something and uploading it to your favorite site, whatever that might be, okay? Um, that is still very old world. We're publishing video or sound or text in these spaces, right, or our photos, right? What we're suggesting is, again, I'll use that metaphor again, the digital pop-up book. Right, how to actually make experiences come to life. And what they're doing, and I, I, one, I don't think they're done because the culture <laughs> is moving, and right. so we're always asking for new things of them. Right? How do we integrate more of your Facebook Connect? How do we, you know, how, how, how? Because the culture's moving, right? And so you're never going to be done, which is exciting. No. What they have done for us is if anybody's old school media maker here might remember a program called Director. So director was a way to kind of, in linear media, sequence events, which were editing or other sort of interactive events, right? And it's what the Rides platform does for us is allows a storyteller to say, hey, I have this idea, and storytellers that haven't worked with it can work with us to find out ways to do that, but literally understand this would be a great space for you to get an email or for your printer to print out this form so you have the same piece of text that, you know, the person in the movie has. And they've enabled all of those technologies to work across platforms. That hasn't existed in the past. 
In the past, we've spent so much time and money hacking together ways, solutions. Okay, how is it that I can get their t Twitter streams to work and their phone to ring and, and all that? And it's a mess. And what I think Fourth Wall has done for us for the first time is actually create a platform for that to happen. The next stage that I can imagine or I would like to see happen with these kind of is authoring tools. How to open that up on your favorite branded you know, video host and be able to actually do this for yourself, okay? So the technology is being built in a way that let's get there, we'll be drag and drop where we can actually say now here, make a phone ring, use this form to get people to put in that. And so we're pushing towards that. Absolutely. So that's, that's the goal is authoring tools. And I, I can name four other companies that I know off the top of my head that are starting to do authoring tools. And hopefully there's dozens more out there. And it's certainly a growing field. So that to me is uh, profoundly interesting and keeps that barrier lower and lower mm -hmm. for what that means as a storyteller. How do I do it? Like, you know, so right now it's, uh, we're not there completely yet. It's still sort of a white label situation with brands that we would bring to that can do that. But, but we're moving there and I think then the cost keeps going down also with that. Right. Sorry. We are out of time, but we'd love to continue the conversation, especially over cocktails in the other room. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you so much.